my literary lady for the month of November is Morasaki Shikibu, who apparently wrote The Tale of Genji. The world know it not, but you, Autumn, I confess it. Your wind at night fall stabs deep into my heart. I had never heard of her, so I looked it up, and it turns out she wrote what is considered to be the first novel. This is from the 11th century. It's a Japanese classic. I'm definitely going to add that to my TBR. I kind of feel like I shouldn't let myself start it right now though because I have so many books that I'm meaning to read. I have a bunch of things that I was in the middle of back in September and then in October it was the Boutier Readathon and I did get through my entire TBR for that. But I kind of put a bunch of things on the shelf um, that I'd like to finish before the end of the year. One of them was the memoirs of Lady Hyegyong. That is actually a Korean classic written in the Joseon dynasty about a kind of queen of Korea. I have picked God Emperor of Dune back up, so I've been making some progress in that. Do you guys like my new alpaca sheets? Aren't they kind of adorable? Wouldn't Jin be proud? Um, anyway, uh, P.G. Woodhouse, I was in the middle of rereading Joy in the Morning, which is very fun. One of Bertie's harebrained schemes had just failed, and they were in the midst of coming up with another, so I would like to finish that. I have started A Handful of Dust by Evelyn Wah. I just shared this in my um, book haul. I had a book depository order recently. I don't really like it so far. <laughs> I'm kind of wondering if I shouldn't have bought it. Ah, one of those cases where I probably should have gotten the library book first. But I'm not actually, let's see, I'm like a third of the way through. Um, so maybe it'll improve. I don't know. Evelyn Wah. Oh, is he right here actually? Look, here it is. This, is, this quote is used so often on the back of Woodhouse novels that it always makes me think Evil and Moi and I should be friends, but then I pick up an Evil and Moi book and it's just, you know, a little flat. The storyline is, is not um, really my cup of tea and the characters so far, Brenda is awful. Um, I didn't realize that they would be so bad. Like, Brenda seemed okay at first, but then it's like, nope, she was awful. See, I actually like spoilers. I probably should have looked up <laughs> the plot line, and then I, I would have had uh, low expectations. I didn't exactly have high expectations, but I didn't know anything about the plot line going into it. Yeah, Beaver, uh, I also do not like. Luckily, we're seeing less and less of Beaver. Tony seems all right, um, and I think maybe this story is going to turn more towards Tony, so although even Tony's not great, to be honest. <laughs> there was some good writing that I enjoyed, though. All over England, people were waking up queasy and despondent. Tony lay for ten minutes, very, very happily planning the renovation of his ceiling. Then he rang the bell. <laughs> Here's a very seasonal passage. Shafts of November sunshine stream down from the lancet and oriel, tinctured in green and gold, ghouls and azar by the emblazoned coats broken by the leaded devices into countless points of, and patches of colored light. Brenda descended the great staircase step by step through alternations of dusk and rainbow. So I am going to keep going. We'll see what I think. I have also read... I have Vile Bodies, which is not a very pleasant sounding title, but I didn't like dislike this book. I thought it was all right. It's one of those books where I'm constantly debating, do I just leave it on my shelf? Will I want to reread it someday? Should I, you know, give it away, get rid of it? But I somehow was expecting to like Handful of Dust more than this, and so far I don't. But I'll, I'll have to finish it and see how I feel afterwards. Once I've made some progress in um, those other books, <laughs> I will let myself start either a reread or a brand new read. These were also in my um, book depository book haul. I ordered them recently. I really like the covers. These two I've read before and are two of my absolute favorite Elizabeth Googe novels. This one I've never read before, so I'm very excited to try it. I redid my um, BTS display a little bit. I got out these photos were from um, the winter package set. I wish I could find a dupe for that coat because I'm sure it was ridiculously expensive, but it's so, so cute. The Bangtan boys were in Finland for winter package last year and I just absolutely loved all of their outfits. The aesthetic was so great. Pretty soon I will be adding B to this, um, to this uh, display. BTS's new album comes out in November. I'm super excited.
had my everyman pocket poets out here because they seemed very appropriate and seasonal. I feel like I've been going for a lot of Robert Frost. This poem is actually about October, but we had such a mild beginning of November that it feels uh, very appropriate. Oh hush, October morning mild, thy leaves have ripened to the fall. Tomorrow's wind, if it be wild, should waste them all. The crows above the forest call, tomorrow they may form and go. Oh hushed October morning mild, begin the hours of this day slow. Make the day seem to us less brief. Heart's not averse to being beguiled. Beguile us in the way you know. Release one leaf at break of day, at noon release another leaf. One from our trees, one far away. Retard the sun with gentle mist, enchant the land with amethyst. Slow, slow, for the grape's sake, if they were all, whose leaves already are burnt with frost, whose clustered fruit must else be lost, for the grape's sake along the wall. There is actually also in here a November a uh, poem. Where is it? It was towards the beginning. My sorrow when she's here with me thinks these dark days of autumn rain are beautiful as days can be. She loves the bear, the withered tree. She walks the sodden pasture lane. Her pleasure will not let me stay. She talks and I am fain to list. She's glad the birds are gone away. She's glad her simple worsted gray is silver now with clinging mist. The desolate deserted trees, the faded earth, the heavy sky, the beauties she so truly sees. She thinks I have no eye for these and vexes me for reason why. Not yesterday I learned to know the love of bare November days before the coming of the snow, but it were vain to tell her so and they are better for her praise. One frost poem that's actually not in this one, but it is in the, um, the Four Seasons is Nothing Gold Can Stay. Nature's first green is gold, her heart is hue to hold, her early leaf's a flower, but only so an hour. Then leaf subsides to leaf, so Eden sank to grief. So dawn goes down to day, nothing gold can stay. The beginning makes me think of spring, because the early buds on the trees really do look like little red flowers. The same little buds that I filmed um, earlier this spring and put in some of my spring reading vlogs have now drifted down, just a few last, few last leaves clinging. But of course, there will be new red buds in the spring, and next fall, the gold will be back. So I did in fact finish a handful of dust. It was not really worth it. Honestly, I think this is gonna be going in the Goodwill bag. It was that bad. It just, like, there was no point to it. I guess I'll give you guys a quick rundown. So a spoiler warning, this is about Tony and his wife Brenda, and they live at, is it Hetton Hall? You know, Tony's ancestral estate in England. And at first, it seems like they're happy together. Tony really loves and tries to care for his house. But then Brenda, for no apparent reason, starts an affair with this younger guy named Beaver. And it's completely unclear why she would take up with this guy because, like, there's literally nothing interesting or compelling about him. And it just seems really unclear why she suddenly got tired of Tony because they'd been married several years. They had a son. I mean, Tony is totally blindsided by it. So I don't know if Evil and Wah wanted us to feel like Tony where we really couldn't understand why Brenda started acting like this. I mean, I guess she had been a jerk all along. But yeah, basically everything goes wrong. Their son dies. Brenda asks for a divorce. And at first, Tony is just kind of going along with it and doing, you know, whatever she says. 
but she's so spectacularly unreasonable. She expects him to divorce her and then also basically sell his ancestral estate so that he can continue to support her financially after they're divorced. I wish I could say that part was unrealistic, but in fact, people are sometimes just astonishingly unreasonable. So it was satisfying to see Tony finally stick up for himself and say, you know what, no, <laughs> this is not how this is gonna go down. And I thought maybe things would get better from there, but no. Tony decides that he needs to leave England for a while, so he ends up meeting this like explorer and accompanies him to South America for some expedition. And if Tony had just died in the jungle, cause he gets fever, if he had just died in the jungle, that would have been actually a good ending. But in fact, he ends up being found by this like crazy guy who lives out in the middle of the jungle and basically is held hostage by him. So he recovers from his fever, but everyone assumes he's dead because he's basically been kidnapped. And yeah, then that's the end of the story. It's like, what was the point of this? I just got absolutely nothing out of this book. So yeah, I'm I'm pretty annoyed with myself now that I did not research it more. There was nothing to redeem this book <laughs> for me. So even though Evelyn Waugh and I both like P.G. Woodhouse, that doesn't mean that I'm gonna be a fan of Evelyn Waugh. But I did finish um, Joy in the Morning, the P.G. Woodhouse uh, that I have been reading. You can never go wrong with Bertie and Jeeves. It's just such delightful sort of blather. Cause Bertie does often go on. Like when he could just tell you something in a sentence, he never does that. He like will first tell you a story from his school days or try to remember a literary illusion, you know, just on the tip of his tongue. There are just so many random literary illusions. I liked this one. It was many years since this cheese right and I had started what I believe is known as plucking the gowans fine. And there had been a time when we'd plucked them rather assiduously. Apparently that is um, Robert Burns, but there's also lots of Shakespeare. In this one, there was a running gag about a uh, porpentine. Entirely through your instrumentality, I shall shortly be telling Uncle Percy things about himself, which will do something to his knotted and combined locks, which at the moment has slipped my memory. Make his knotted and combined locks to part and each particular hair to stand on end like quills upon the fretful porpentine, sir. Porpentine? Yes, sir. That can't be right. There isn't such a thing. However, let that pass. But he doesn't let it pass. Later, he says, I am not a weak man, geez, but when I think of what will happen if Stilton cops me while I am draped in that uniform, it makes my knotted and combined locks, what was that gag of yours? Part, sir, and each particular hair stand on end, wasn't it? Yes, sir. Like, quills upon the fretful porpentine. That's right. And that brings me back to it. What the dickens is a porpentine? A porcupine, sir. Oh, a porcupine. Why didn't you say that at first? It's been worrying me all day. <laughs> he also just casually drops Latin phrases all the time. Precisely, sir. Rem acu tedigisti. A Latin expression, literally, it means... You have touched the matter with a needle. Put my finger on the nub. Exactly, sir. Towards the beginning, he goes to a bookstore to buy Jeeves some Spinoza. Of course, I ought to have known that it's silly to try to buy a book when you go to a bookshop. It merely startles and bewilders the inmates. The moth-eaten old bird who had stepped forward to attend me ran true to form. A book, sir, he said with ill-concealed astonishment. Spinoza, I replied, specifying. This had him rocking back on his heels. Did you say Spinoza, sir? Spinoza was what I said. He seemed to be feeling that if we talked this thing out long enough, as man to man, we might eventually hit upon a formula. You do not mean the spinning wheel. No. It would not be the poison pin. It would not. Or with gun and camera in little known Borneo, he queried, trying a long shot. <laughs> Spinoza, I repeated firmly. That was my story, and I intended to stick to it. He sighed a bit, like one who feels the situation has got beyond him. I will go and see if we have it in stock, sir, but possibly this may be what you are requiring, said to be very clever. clever. He pushed off, spinoza ing under his breath in a hopeless sort of way, leaving me clutching a thing called spindrift. It looked pretty foul. <laughs> its jacket showed a female with a green oblong face sniffing at a purple lily, and I was just about to fling it from me and start a hunt for that poisoned pin of which he had spoken when I became aware of someone good gracious birdying and turning, found that the animal cries proceeded from a tall girl of commanding aspect who had oiled up behind me. Let's see, this collection also has Very Good Jeeves and Right Ho Jeeves, so maybe I'll have to reread one of those two next. All right, friends, I thought I would finish up this November reading wrap up with my favorite author I've been reading this month. I saved the best for last. I've read three books by Eva Ibbotson. I have read her in the past. I read The Secret Countess, which was actually one of my favorite books that I read all of last year. It was in my top 
19 reads of 2019. I can't believe we're so close to the end of 2020. Like, I have to start thinking about my my top 20. Will I be able to make a list of 20 uh, reads of 2020? I've been starting to put put together um, some of those books, and I'm sure Eva Ibbotson will be on my list for 2019 and 2020. I just love her characters, her voice. Eva Ibbotson was born in Vienna right before World War II. Her family had to flee Austria, um, and so she grew up in England, and her heroines kind of follow a similar trajectory. Um, so I read Magic Flutes and The Morning Gift, which are both like adult novels, and then The Dragonfly Pool, which I'm pretty sure is a children's novel. Um, the Dragonfly Pool reminded me a little bit of The Princess Diaries because it featured like a sort of Genovia type little country in Europe. It did take place right um, at the outset of World War II, so that was a major theme running through it. It's about these students at a British boarding school called Delderton Hall, I think. Tally is the main character and she hears about a music festival, dance festival happening in this little country and she just feels like we have to go. So she kind of slaps together a music and dance routine and like forces all of her friends to be in it. Luckily the school they go to is very quirky and the professors are very quirky and so they come around and they go to the country and they end up meeting the prince who's about the same age as the students and there are all sorts of plots afoot so they really have to help the prince. It's definitely kind of a madcap adventure but super fun to read. And then The Morning Gift, that was an adult uh, an adult novel. That was also set right at the outbreak of World War II. Ruth was the heroine of that one, but we also get to know her whole family, the Burgers. Her father is a professor at the Museum of Natural History in Vienna. So it's so fun to hear about the environment she grows up in, learning. The Burgers do have Jewish heritage, so they end up having to flee when the Nazis come to power. So then we hear about them setting up in London as refugees, and the other refugees they meet and kind of like the little family unit they establish there. There's a British professor who helps Ruth out. We hear about his home which is in I think Northumbria and oh my gosh the description of it was so beautiful. It's like this ancient castle right on the beach. I highlighted so many notes here. Here this was about the professor, uh, British professor and his ancestral home. Quinn as a child had known exactly where God lived. Not in the Holy Land as painted in his illustrated Bible but in the swirling, ever-changing, cloud-racked sky above his home. The description of when Ruth like first sees like the beach and the clouds and just like the scenery around the castle is so beautiful. How could this have happened overnight, this miracle? How could there be so much light, so much movement? How could everything be so terribly there? All of Eva Evanson's heroines just live so fully and passionately and like just care so much about everything around them. A shaft of brilliant light pierced the surface and caught the needle of a lighthouse on a distant island. There were fields on this ocean, patches of shining brightness, others like gunmetal and calm oasises like lagoons. It never stopped being the sea. She had not been prepared for that. She thought, no, here I can't be alone because there isn't any alone or not alone. There's only light and air and water and I am part of it and everyone I love is part of it. But it's outside time, it's outside needing and wanting. Ruth sees rapture in a sunrise, but she also manages to make friends wherever she goes. At the university, there's a sheep penned up who was supposed to be used for an experiment but wasn't, and she ends up taking care of the sheep. She says, I can see that you aren't where you would choose to be, but I assure you that right now the world is full of people who are not where they would choose to be. All over Belsize Park and Finchley and Swiss Cottage, I could show you such people and you belong to a noble race because you are in the Psalms and St. Francis chose you to preach to, and I can see why, because you have listening eyes. <laughs> I will recite some Goethe for you, which you will like, I think, because he is an extremely calming poet, though somewhat melancholy, I do admit. I did hugely enjoy The Morning Gift, but I think Magic Flutes was my favorite. Putzerl was the heroine of this one. So Putzerl is an Austrian princess, but her family, you know, they've kind of lost their fortune and they're trying to sell their ancient castle, this castle. But is it Pfaffenstein? See, if I remember the name of the castle, I'm not sure I could even pronounce it, but it's basically like this huge ancient fortress and, and she actually tells about the history of it, which I'm pretty sure she probably like based it on a real castle, but I 
I have to look that up actually. I don't know if the castle in this is a real castle in Europe, but all Putzerl really wants to do is work at the opera in Vienna. She just is passionate about music and wants to serve music, and so she gets a job as like the most menial servant at the opera, and she doesn't tell anybody that, you know, she's actually an, an Austrian princess. And the hero, meanwhile, his name is Guy, and he kind of came from nothing. He was an orphan in London, but he just has this like powerful, vital force, and he really worked his way up and ends up becoming basically a millionaire. There is a British aristocrat who he fell in love with, in Vienna, actually. But of course, when they were young and he was still poor, she refused him. But now that he's rich, he wants to kind of sweep her off her feet. He ends up buying the castle, and he has this grand, grand party and invites all of the Europe European royalty. I loved hearing about the opera in Vienna, but I also loved hearing about the castle and the history of it and these royal families. The dizzying capacity of the Austrians to refer to absolutely everybody by some appalling diminutive or nickname, which Guy had forgotten, now returned to his mind. Having gathered that cousin Pippi was Pope Pius the Fifteenth, he was now informed, though he had been careful not to ask, that Maxi, alias Maximilian Ferdinand, Princess Patau, and Neuseldel, was the young man they had picked for Putzerl to marry, there being, owing to the cruel war and the sordid revolutions in various places which had followed it, quite simply no one else. <laughs> Here's another uh, passage I highlighted. The English were swine, of course, everyone knew that, but they did understand breakfast. <laughs> so yes, I would highly recommend Eva Ibbotson. I have enjoyed those so much. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. If you did, make sure you give it a thumbs up, make sure you're subscribed. I hope you had a very happy Thanksgiving and a wonderful November reading month. I'll talk to you again soon, and until then, I hope you have a magical and bookish day. Bye, guys!